Hi, welcome back to uh, AI Practical Applications. My name is Jack Dowling. I'm the CEO of Odom Technology Group. Today's format of this session will be an interview with Benjamin Siborabaum, and he's going to present on building computer vision platform. Um, ben is a very impressive guy, very knowledgeable about AI and got a horde of experience. So uh, we'll get cranked up and going here in just a minute. And uh, uh, I think you really enjoy this presentation. It's eye opening and will help you better understand how um, how AI companies actually develop their product. For planning purposes, I probably plan for a little over an hour on this presentation. It's pretty extensive, but it's very detailed and will help you understand how um, AI developers do what they do and how um, DevOps. Uh, handles uh, AI platforms. Okay, so uh, let me introduce you to uh, to Ben Savorabong. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier, Ben's going to take us through building computer vision platforms. And uh, with that, let me uh, turn control over to uh, to Ben, and uh, we'll get right into the presentation. All right, sharing the screen. Can you see that okay? Perfect. Okay, yeah, so um, this presentation is called Computer Vi Building Computer Vision Platforms, uh, Lessons Learned Deploying Computer Vision Applications at Scale. So um, the background of this is, you know, I come from a traditional software development background, worked at a lot of different companies doing that, and I had the pleasure of slightly transitioning into the field of software development for computer vision uh, in the last few years. Worked on a few applications at two different companies, and both of them were in the scaling phase of the computer vision deployment. And I noticed a lot of patterns, um, things that kept coming up over and over again. So this presentation kind of sums all that up. Um, I gave this initially at the computer visionaries meetup in the DFW area. Uh, got a lot of interest, talked to Jack there. And so th that's where this comes from initially, right? Um, this is geared towards computer vision professionals and software development professionals, people who are kind of familiar with this space, but we're not going to go super in-depth to computer vision or software engineering. It's more of the, the blend between the two and some practical lessons there. Um, there's my contact information at the very bottom um, down here, and it says July 2023. This is actually October, but that's when I presented this originally. All right. So here's our agenda. Uh, we have an about me slide, you've got to do it. Um, we're gonna compare machine learning versus traditional software development. Uh, what's the similarities between them? What's a little bit different between them? Uh, and then we're gonna talk about some um, things you have to think about when you're designing for computer vision applications. Uh, we've got four main points here, bandwidth, IoT, hardware, data management, and testing. And then at the very end, we've got um, the nice screenshot slide is the checklist. If I were to do it all over again, these are the things that I would I would put in my checklist, uh, save myself a lot of time. Hopefully save you guys some time too. Okay, about me. So currently I am working at 7-Eleven R&D. Um, here in DFW, I am the tech lead of the platform engineering team over there. Um, but before that, you know, I did some research work in my undergraduate at the University of North Texas, that was in network security uh, and mobile app development. I uh, did some internships at Fidelity Investments and Nokia, great places, love them both. Um, and then I started at, um, well, I've actually skipped one here. Uh, I was a consultant for a while. I worked with Hitachi Consulting, which I think changed their name since then. Um, eventually I came to research and development at 7-Eleven. I was just a software engineer at the time working on their cashierless project. Um, I was there for a while. That was when I first got exposed to computer vision on that cashierless application. And then I moved to a startup which did all computer vision, all in the retail space. Um, did that for a few years and now I'm back here at 7-Eleven R&D, right? There's my contact information there. Um, 
my personal website, email, all that, and then just some pictures. Uh, I enjoy rock climbing in my free time, traveling. Um, yeah. So first section, machine learning versus traditional software. Let's talk about traditional software first. That's where I come from. A lot of people will be familiar with this. So you really have this cyclical um, cycle in software development. This is you know, the agile development cycle these days, which is pretty much the standard. Um, so you have the plan phase where you're just deciding what you're going to build. You're going to develop some application. Uh, you're going to deploy that application to your users, and you're going to wait and see what happens. Hopefully you get some positive response from them. But if you don't, um, or even if you do, you're going to keep going with the cycle. Plan your next series of work, do all this, right? This is continually happening. Uh, if you're in like a scrum style, you're going to do this every two weeks. But this is really a continuous process with these four steps here for traditional software development. Now, um, the machine learning life cycle can be kind of mapped onto this same cycle um, where instead of a plan step, you have an exploration step. So a lot of times in machine learning, you don't really know what you're going to build until you do some exploratory work. Um, but then after you do the exploratory work, you find a model or an algorithm that fits your use case pretty well and you think is going to be good for you. Um, you're going to train a model for it, usually using some small set of data at first, but then over time you get some more data. You're going to uh, deploy that model. So the deployment step here is now called inference. So the model is going to run in production on new data that it didn't see in training. This is where you kind of get uh, the value to your users. And then you're going to collect some data so that you can do some more exploration, some more training. And just like before, this process sort of goes around and around in a cycle. It's continual, right? So very similar. Um, thought process here, but the actual steps themselves are a little bit different. So let's talk about uh, what are the big differences and what are the similarities between these two. Um, differences is on the left, but we'll start with the similarities, right? Um, so the first big similarity here is the deployment step. Uh, we didn't call it out specifically on the ML lifecycle, but in both cases, you've developed some software artifact and you have to deploy it. Um, to edge systems, to users, to backend services, you know, it, it spans the whole gamut. Um, and that part really is no different compared to any other software development lifecycle. So if you're coming from a software development background, deployment should be no problem for you. The next one, like I've been saying, it's iterative. This is a cyclical process. You kind of keep getting better over time. You don't expect to hit the ground running day one. You just slowly get better over time. This is the same with both a software product and a machine learning based product. Um, another thing that's similar is your customer expectations. Um, so customers have this expectation of quality from the code that we deliver to them, reliability, trustworthiness. Um, a lot of times with machine learning systems, you have code and outputs that are not 100% accurate. You're going to get some fuzzy outputs, like 80% accuracy. If you're really good, you might get 90 or 95% accuracy. Your customers at the end of the day don't really care that you built it with machine learning, even though we as engineers love AI and machine learning. The customer doesn't really care. They care about the reliability of the software, the trustworthiness, the quality. Um, so somehow we have to bake those things in, even though we are inherently using a system that is uh, probabilistic, right? So that's going to affect a lot of the design of what we build. Um, let's go to the differences now. So that very first step, or the top one in the cycle, the explore phase versus the plan phase. Uh, in a traditional software system, the planning is oftentimes done by product managers, maybe by business analysts. Um, you know, It's really not hard to figure out what these features need to be for a software system. Um, and it's delivered by you know, customer values, and you know, it's very high level. The exploratory phase, on the other hand, in machine learning, um, often needs engineers. It, it really needs data scientists or a data analysts, someone with a lot of technical know-how to do this exploratory phase. Um, so you don't necessarily have as much PM involvement. Uh, you have replaced your PMs with these data scientists. We're going to try to see what's even possible with the data that you have. 
again, another difference is you don't develop these algorithms by hand, where a lot of times just training a model, that's kind of the whole point of machine learning is that you don't have to write the code, every single if statement by hand, um, you're using a model for that. So the training cycle is inherently different from the development cycle. And then data relevancy. So in a traditional software system, um, it doesn't happen super often these days, but it is possible to build an application today. And as long as the inputs and the outputs you know, are preserved, that code will still work five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, the technology progresses and realistically that's not true, um, but it, it, the code will work the same way today as it will 10 years from now. In machine learning, this is often not the case. If you start taking pictures of things today and you start um, training a model on that, what you'll often see is that the model will decrease in performance over time. We call this data drift um, or data relevancy. So you, there's this need to constantly keep the model updated as the data changes over time. Imagine if you trained a model to detect the weather. Um, it might work really well for a long time, but you know everyone knows that weather patterns are changing in the world. And in a thousand years, the weather patterns are not gonna be the same as they are today. So that same model, nothing has changed in the model, but uh, it's not gonna work nearly as well. This same thing happens in most machine learning systems, maybe not on that grand of a scale, but your data is going to, um, to change over time, right? Okay, so let's talk about some pitfalls. Um, in this transition between traditional software development to machine learning, there's a lot of pitfalls that you can make. These are some of the ones that I've made or I've seen other people make on teams that I worked on or teams that were adjacent to me. Uh, and the big three that I've seen so far are treating machine learning exploration as software development. Um, we'll talk about that. Splitting teams up by function, um, that one as well. There's a lot of different roles in a machine learning workflow. Um, and you have a tendency to split them up by role. And then testing, or the lack thereof. Um, a lot of people I, I'm seeing don't really know how to test machine learning systems. And because they don't know how, they end up testing in production. They just deploy it and, and hope to see what happens. Um, but as we talked about, our customers' expectations of reliability and quality haven't changed. Um, our technology has. We have to adapt and learn how to test these systems. Right. Um, do we have another slide here? Oh, designing for CV applications. Yeah. I think there's a little bit more on that slide. Okay, oh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this first. I thought I had another slide for it, but I guess not. Um, the treating machine learning exploration as software development. So what we mean by that is we tend to want to track development effort in some sort of management tool like Jira. We break it up into tasks. We ask for deliverables, ask for story points, um, which is all fine and good for software development. A lot of times you have a lot of knowns. Um, the thing is machine learning exploration is not inherently known you're trying to look into data to see what kind of insights you can gain from it. Uh, a lot of times this is um, cutting edge work. A lot of times you don't really know what the outcome is. Maybe we're investigating different models that just came out, uh, a new YOLO v6 model was just published and you wanna see if it works on your use case. This is something that you, know, you could try to track in Jira, but some of these tasks are really impossible to um, to judge before you start doing them. And I've seen a lot of teams in a lot of different places get really bogged down with trying to track exploration type work. What is probably better to do is to identify what type of work is exploratory and what type of work is for known systems. Don't really track the exploratory work as harshly as you would track a known system work. So discovering algorithms, seeing what algorithms work for you is exploratory work. You can put it in Jira, but don't try to track velocity on it. Once you know what algorithms you're gonna be working with and you have a POC, translating that into a real system can be tracked like any traditional software development, right? Um, splitting teams by function. Um, this is very common in a lot of companies to say have a QA team, software development team, and a computer vision team. Um, this ends up in 
code that has a very, very big divide in the middle of it between the computer vision and the software development side and the QA side, you're better off having smaller teams that have all of these functionality built in to that whole team. Um, and you're going to end up with a more cohesive product at the end of the day. Otherwise, you know, you find that you're going to have a lot of time spent communicating between these teams. And then when you try to integrate your product at the very end, it's not really going to gel together super well. And then testing, we should do it. I have a whole section in this PowerPoint later about testing. Okay. Designing for CV applications. Here we go. Now we're going to talk about some of the specific challenges of computer vision, right? Computer vision is a subset of machine learning and AI, um, which specifically talks about images and videos, usually just images because a video is just a bunch of images. And this poses some unique challenges that you don't see in traditional software development. And sometimes you don't even see in other AI systems. So we've got these four issues here and we're going to go through them one by one. The first one is bandwidth. Now, bandwidth is a big concern in computer vision because images are large, right? Uh, especially these days as cameras are getting better and better and better, we're fitting more megapixels into our images. They're getting bigger at a faster and faster rate, um, which really puts a strain on our networks and our IO. So in any computer vision system, you tend to have to find this balance between how expensive is the system how much bandwidth do I have? And where do I want to do the compute? So we have techniques to um, change the location of the compute so that the images don't have to be uploaded all the way up to the cloud and you don't need a gigabit internet connection, right? So generally, if you want to um, save money, you can do that by using more bandwidth. So you can put all your compute in the cloud, or you can put it in your home or something, take a bunch of images, and then send them to you. Um, but if you can spend a little bit more money and you don't have as much bandwidth, you can push the compute closer to the edge. Do it where the image is taken. right? And then event-driven architecture is going to help us a lot with this. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Here's a typical computer vision pipeline. So you take a picture here. You're going to obviously do some pre-processing, um, like input normalization. You might adjust the lighting, the gain. You might add some metadata to this image, like when it was taken, where it was taken, some pre-processing step here. Uh, and then you're going to start two different tasks in parallel. One task is going to run your computer vision model and get some kind of business value out of it. So maybe you're taking pictures to detect hard hats in a construction site. That's an example that I um, heard about sometime in a podcast. Um, they detect the number of hard cats that people are wearing. They're going to produce a report. That's one line of data. The next line of data is they're going to take a subset of those images. They're going to annotate them. And then they're going to train their model. So this is the continual improvement part. You kind of do these in parallel. Uh, but if you think about what kind of data is being passed at each of these steps, right here, we're talking about an image. Um, we're going to do the pre-processing that still outputs an image and metadata. So now we have a little bit more data. Um, the collection step is also images, but there's a reason why it's a subset. It's because of the bandwidth issue. If we could upload every single image, we would, but most of the time we don't have that much bandwidth. So we upload a randomly sampled subset. Um, to the inference step, we take an image in and we produce business metrics out. So the output of this is going to be some JSON document or, you know, some very, very small piece of data compared to the image itself. So once you get to you know, about this step here, you have a much smaller bandwidth requirement. So if you can push everything to the left side of this line onto the edge and do all that compute on the edge, you're going to save a lot of money. Um, not, not money, bandwidth. You're going to spend a lot more money. If you want to push all of your compute in the cloud, you're going to spend more, uh, less money, but you're going to save a lot. Um, right. So here we've got three different options. Generally, you have three different options here. You can do everything uh, in the cloud. We call this centralized compute. 
you can do things on a gateway device. So this is where you have, you know, some bigger device that's on-prem close to where you took the, the images, but not literally in the same device as the camera. So if you think about like a Simply Safe system, they take a lot of images from maybe five or six cameras in your house, but they're sending that to a local server that's also in your house. That's what we call gateway compute. Um, and then you have edge compute. You could also put GPUs in each of those cameras and then do all of the processing there. So these are the three different places where you can put your compute and where you decide to put them really just depends on your bandwidth and the cost, right? And I've seen different companies use, you know, all three of these, some combination of these, it really just depends. Let's talk a little bit about event-driven architecture. Uh, in most computer vision systems, because you see this is like a, a pipeline, this is a series of steps that has to happen from left to right in order. You have to capture your image, pre-process it, do the inference, create the report. All this stuff has to happen one at a time. So this becomes a very natural fit for event-driven architecture. If you put a queue in between each of these lines, and that's using some system like Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ or even Amazon SQS, um, it gives you a buffer in between each one, and it allows you to scale each of these components independently of the others, uh, which is very important for computer vision because compute is our biggest cost here. And we want to make sure we're fully utilizing the compute that we have. So imagine if I had one giant machine that was doing all of these steps just in sequence. We would go through this step, and then this, and then this, and this, and this. Most of these steps are doing no work at any given time. Um, and if we think about the hardware requirements of this, you know, the inference step for computer vision often requires a GPU. So it is the training step. Um, but none of the other ones do. So if you can split these two steps, training and inference, onto different machines that have GPUs, the other machines don't need GPUs. And you can save a lot of money on your compute costs. You can only do this if you actually have a queuing system, which lets you split these tasks up between the computers that you have. And what you'll find is you may have different numbers for parallelism that you can achieve with each of these steps. So with capture, if you have 20 cameras, you can capture 20 images all at once. You might find that you can do all the pre-processing for those on one machine, or it might take five machines. And then you might find that inference is a little bit of a heavier task. You might need 10 machines to do all the inference, but the reporting you can do it all at one machine again. So with these queues, you're really able to scale up uh, all of your processing power and really fine tune the needs of each individual step to the hardware that you're gonna want. If you don't do this, you're really gonna find that you're overspending on compute and in terms of practically scaling out this application, it's gonna get way too costly, way too quickly. Uh, we really like Moore's Law and it helps us to you know, believe that we're gonna get cheaper GPUs in the future, but until we do, uh, we need to add these queuing systems and split up these steps into different machines. That way we can actually utilize the machines that we have and not overspend. So event-driven architecture is a great tool in computer vision systems to split up the compute and make sure you are utilizing your compute as much as you can. Some examples, right? So like I said, we have some examples of edge compute. This is Simply Safe. So in Simply Safe, you have the security cameras and they can stream data 24 seven to some Simply Safe server. That would waste a lot of bandwidth though, because most of the time in your house, there's nothing going on. Because this is a security camera, what they do is they build a motion detection AI that runs on the camera. The model is so small that it can run on that very small amount of compute that they have in the camera itself. And then all that does is it detects motion. And once that happens, it sees that something happened, then they start streaming the rest of their uh, video feed. That saves you a lot of bandwidth in your house so that you're only recording video whenever there's something interesting happening. That's an example of edge compute. Imagine if they tried to do that with a centralized compute, they would have to stream the video 24 seven to some central server where they could run the model for motion detection and then send that data all the way back. 
you know, you're someone would have been able to break into your house and, and leave by the time you got a notification. And also, they would use most of your internet connection. So that's edge compute. Gateway compute, um, Spacey was one of these examples. So at Spacey, the models that we were trying to run were just a little bit too heavy for the devices that we were using to capture cameras. We we're trying to do some pretty heavy object detection. And there's about 150 devices in each store. Now, 150 little GPUs is really expensive. So instead, what Spacey did, what a lot of systems do that are deployed at this kind of scale, is they have a gateway, which is in the store, maybe in some closet somewhere. But it's a big, beefy unit. It's got a really big GPU, maybe an A30 um, or 2700. And so all of the devices in the store will stream their data to that gateway, which then uses its really heavy GPU to do the processing on behalf of all those 150 camera sensors. This is a really, really good strategy. If you have a lot of data locally and you can justify the cost of a gateway device, these things are expensive, but it's still cheaper than buying 150 different GPUs for these tiny little robots, right? So gateway compute is a great middle ground to use if you're at that scale that justifies it. And lastly, centralized compute. This is what you use if bandwidth is not really an issue or deploying at the edge is not really possible. So here we have some researchers that are using satellite imagery to estimate vegetation levels. Now, because it's a satellite, they didn't really have the option of using gateway compute or edge compute because the satellite was already you know, deployed up to space. So they had to use centralized compute. And so they just take the images from the satellite and then they process them all in-house in some data center or maybe just in someone's laptop. Um, this is great. It's the cheapest option. But of course, there are limitations here. They're very limited by how much bandwidth they have, how many images they can capture from the satellite. Um, they could do all this optimization to get the model to run super fast, but it wouldn't matter if the satellite can only capture one image an hour. right? So centralized compute is often the cheapest way to go, but it's also the most limiting. Whereas on the other side, edge compute, is the least limiting in that sense, but is also the most expensive way to go. Gateway compute we usually find is a good middle ground. Again, you have to be at the scale where it justifies it. Okay, that was the bandwidth um, section of challenges of building CV systems, right? Play around with where you wanna place your compute, you can start on the centralized compute side. And then as you find the need to scale out more, you can move closer towards edge compute. And it's, it's a spectrum. You can move some tasks uh, in and out as you need to. But the next one we're going to talk about is IoT and hardware. Uh, all CV systems are IoT systems. You really don't have an option because you have a camera that is taking pictures for you and you're processing data that comes out of that camera that, that turns you into an IoT system, unless you're in a very specialized use case. That means you have all of the traditional problems that come with IoT, um, networking, hardware management, device management. So we're gonna talk about these two, the bathtub curve and device management. These are the ones that I saw, uh, in my experience, people kind of get stumbled on, uh, but IoT and hardware is a whole subfield of its own. It's a whole specialty. This is definitely not touching every problem that is related to IoT, just the ones that I've seen. First one is the bathtub curve. Now, if you are in hardware, if you're an electrical engineer uh, or in logistics at all, you'll think that it is silly that we have to explain the bathtub curve. But if you are a software developer, this may be new information to you. Um, it was to me. So the bathtub curve is this observation that when you're building anything, it tends to fail a lot at the very beginning of its lifespan. And then the failure rate kind of normalizes and then it will fail a lot at the end of its life cycle. Um, each component will have different actual numbers, but the general shape kind of holds. What does this mean for us though? It means that you should account for both of these high failure rate scenarios. You should account for the fact that a lot of your components are gonna fail at the very beginning when they first get deployed or when they first get turned on. This is just because manufacturing is not a perfect process. 
this is not something that a lot of software developers have experience with because we are very used to virtualized environments, AWS, Azure, things where they have done all the grunt work to make sure that every time you run a VM, it's uh, got backups and they can you know, account for this failure rate. They've already done the hard work. When you're building your own IoT system, you have to do this yourself. So how do you account for infant mortality? Is a quality control program. So at Spacey, uh, we were building robots um, that kind of move and they would take pictures of store systems. And we found that we would deploy a lot of them and a good chunk of them would fail within a week of their deployment. It wasn't anything specifically wrong that we did. It was just that our manufacturing wasn't super good yet. And so we were having all these quality control issues. What we found was if we just ran them for a week in our office, just not even doing anything with the data, just running them for a whole week and making sure that they survived that first week. If they survived the first week, they would usually live on to survive for years after that point. And we got through, you know, this is making up a number, but let's say we got 10% of our devices failing that quality control week. That's 10% of our devices that we didn't have to debug in production and troubleshoot and ship to customers. And when we weren't doing this, we definitely got a lot of angry customers and a lot of software developers up late at night trying to debug an issue and just saying, you know what, it must be a hardware issue. Once we figured out this quality control program, we had a much better time. We, the rate of incidents went down to almost none or everything that we saw was an explainable decision because we weren't having hardware failures. Now. On the other end, things are gonna fail at their end of life. It's kind of hard to know what the end of life is before you build the product, but um, just know that you're gonna you know, have random hardware failures again once these devices have been deployed for a year, two years, three years. Motors will start to wear out, camera sensors will start to wear out. So you should be uh, expecting your hardware to fail after some amount of time, and you should know what that failure looks like based on what kind of components you put in your hardware. So a lot of IoT systems run on batteries that may, your CV system may or may not run on a battery, but if it does, you know, you should be prepared for that battery to not hold the charge anymore after a few years. And you should have metrics in place in your application to detect that, to know when it's gonna happen and to preemptively fix it, replace the battery, replace the unit before it goes dead. Um, usually though, if you're gonna hit this end of life, piece you've had some time to mature to get to that point so it's not as much of a concern in early startups or in early companies for new projects infant mortality is definitely the one that that hits hardest um, by the time you're getting to end of life you probably have an operations team and you know some, some better metrics right. let's go into device management um, again these are IoT devices, they have to be managed. In a traditional software system, deployments are pretty easy. You hit a deploy button, some container or some service in the cloud updates, and you're, you're done. Next time your users use your application, they get the newest version. Um, this is not so in IoT because you may have 100 devices out there, 1,000 devices out there at scale, and when you hit that deploy button to update them, they may not always update at the same time. And you may have some edge cases, not may, it's gonna happen, where someone calls to your call center and complains because their device isn't working anymore and you check and they haven't updated it in two years. But it's going to happen, right? So you need to be able to manage these things. So in AWS and in Azure and most major cloud providers, we have uh, device management solutions catered to IoT just use these systems. Don't try to build your own. If you do, you better have a lot of really experienced software developers. But what these things do for you is they provide telemetry, they provide the ability to do firmware updates, they provide real-time monitoring for your systems so that you know exactly which users have devices that haven't been updated in two years. You can contact them and say, hey, we're about to you know, push a breaking change and if you don't update, I'm sorry, then you know, your, your software isn't gonna work anymore. Um, and then it's also very important for your hardware as well. So as you build new products, 
you may decide to upgrade your hardware to get a new camera that has a few more megapixels. And at some point, someone's going to ask, well, how many cameras are out there that haven't been upgraded? How many cameras are using the old camera sensor? Because this might mess with your computer vision algorithms if they're getting images with different resolutions. So you're going to want some kind of system that can track all this information. These managed services are great. If you want to build your own, you can. But you know, Azure and AWS and all the other cloud providers have put a lot of work into making these systems really easy to use and really feature packed. You can take some inspiration from them, uh, use some of the features, and then build the rest on your own. As you get more and more mature, you're going to want to build your own system, but definitely start with these device management solutions. Right. Okay. You know, with these, with the with the centralized systems, you know, like back in the old days, it makes so much more sense to have if you were a CIO to have a company manage your network because from one console they can watch a bunch of companies network, something will turn red, they zoom in and attack it. If you do it yourself, you have to have your own person sitting there monitoring. Is that true with this as well? Where, you know, with the with the Azure or AWS solution, you can watch a whole lot of cameras from one central location and have watch a bunch of locations all at the same time with a with a single person. Do you get that kind of um, uh, exponential coverage by using yes. the solution? Yeah, okay. Yes. And Got it's it. definitely one of those things like, yeah, back if you wanted to build your own network monitoring solution, I mean, there's nothing stopping you. And it's not oh. even that hard of an application to build. It's, it's just very complex. And so do you really want to waste all of your development hours building that solution that already exists? Or do you want to get something off the shelf, use that and, and go on to what actually makes your product, you know, differentiated? Right. Yeah, the, the, it's the old adage: Why build what you can? Why build what you can buy? Yes. You know, focus yep. on your core competencies. If you can get it from somebody else, buy it from. Mm -hmm. And if you're building computer vision systems, more often than not, IoT device management is not the differentiator for your product. You right. should just buy it. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, data management. So um, this is. Just one slide, I think. Um, like I said earlier, bandwidth is a big concern because there's a lot of data um, that gets passed around, and you have a lot of different types of data in a machine learning system. So we have kind of three tiers of data management here from in, in order of scale and level of maturity here. So the first tier is just object storage in like Amazon S3 or some blob storage, Minio, if you want to run with the cloud agnostic provider. This is just somewhere to put your images. It's just image storage, right? Um, and then you have an object index. So once you get more mature and you start needing to index your data and make some queries on it, um, obviously you can't index an image necessarily. You can index the metadata about that image. So that's where the index comes from. Whenever you start, you're gonna want just like a SQL database. Um, the reason why we choose SQL for this is that you don't necessarily know how you're going to cut it up. So I know a lot of the companies are using NoSQL these days. It's all the rage. But for this, because you don't know how you're going to query your data in the future, you might decide to cut it up one way or another way. You might have three different teams cutting it up in different ways. Um, really recommend just use a SQL database for this, but give each team their own database. That way, they can all index these images in different ways. Yeah. As you grow and grow and grow, um, you're going to find that SQL itself is also not fit for the amount of data that you have. So you're going to transform that SQL database into a data warehouse. That's when we're going to use some warehousing techniques like so Snowflake, um, Apache Spark, Hadoop like file structure, um, something that is sharding your data and storing it in a data lake. And then you're also querying it, maybe even still using SQL syntax, but the underlying infrastructure is designed for much larger amounts of data. Um, that's the natural progression for um, what your data is going to look like physically. Um, but there's some tips that um, we have with this. Just like any other software development, you don't want to cross team boundaries with your data management. Uh, just like it's not really good to have a code base that is 
owned by one team, but you have all these other teams trying to make changes to that code base at the same time. Whenever you have a database or a data index, you don't want to have multiple teams using that index. You want to give them two different copies of it or two different indexes. The reason for this is the exploratory phase of uh, the machine learning cycle is where you're cutting up your data in different ways. You're making all sorts of queries and you might manipulate the, the table structure to see if you can unlock some new uh, potential in your data. That's not really gonna work if you have other teams that are dependent on that, that same database, especially if they're traditional software development teams. Um, you really wanna keep your teams split on what data they're using. Another tip, shard your data set by time. If you're using something like Hadoop, um, this happens automatically, but if you're using SQL, you may have to do it yourself. But this is because of the data drift problem that we talked about earlier. Data tends to become non-relevant as time goes on. So in the, um, I talked about the weather example. Another one would be in retail at Spacey, we were taking pictures of products. Now we take a bunch of pictures, now in October of products, we train a model, it can detect all these products. And then Christmas hits and all of a sudden, all the products have changed because everyone likes to update their packaging during Christmas. This is a great example of data drift. All of a sudden, all of our images that we took during October, which were Halloween themed, don't work anymore. All the models don't work. And pretty much, you know, that data isn't completely useless because there's gonna be another Halloween but as more and more years go by, trends will change. Um, and eventually we're just gonna have to pull the plug and say, you know what, any data that we took more than three years ago, we just don't care about anymore. This is gonna be a really, really big task to do if you haven't decided to shard your data set by time ahead of time. So this is really gonna depend on how much data you have and the, the rate of capture, the rate of change, but you know, maybe a monthly shard where you have a different data set for each month or a different data set for each day. And then you can um, decide which data sets you're gonna use when you're training a model. You can say, I only wanna train a model on this month worth of data because this month is all the Christmas products and it doesn't really help us to have these Halloween products in the same data set. It's gonna throw our model off because it's not relevant. So that's gonna be a great tool. Just do that ahead of time, shard your, your data set by time and you'll save yourself um, a lot of headache. And then lastly, collect all the metadata you can. Uh, in software development, we try to tend to keep things lean. Don't you know bloat your database because what if you never end up using that field? It's just tech debt. This is not true for machine learning systems or, or data systems. If you go to any data scientist and ask, what kind of data do you want? They're gonna say, whatever you can give me, like literally everything. Okay. So whenever you're collecting data for the purposes of exploration, machine learning, business insights, you know, try to think of a lot of different points that would be useful. Of course, you have the basic ones like the time, the date, the location, what was in the image. Um, but if you have uh, other concepts in your domain, your business domain, um, you might as well attach those to the image too because you don't want to come up a year from now and say, man, it would be really great if we stored, you know, in retail, if we stored like the manufacturer for each of these images, if we knew all the Kellogg's items and all the Coca-Cola items, we could build a model that would be really useful to these uh, distributors. But because we didn't collect that data, you know, we, we have to start now and then it's going to take us a whole year to collect enough data to get a good model. Maybe not a year, but, um, just collect all the metadata you can. You never know what's going to be useful. You can never have too much data. Um, and storage is cheap these days. So there's really no downsides to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are all the data management tips that I wish I knew beforehand. And lastly, we go on to testing, <clears throat> right? Like I said, a lot of machine learning engineers are not testing their code. Um, this, this comes from a lack of expertise in my experience, and a lack of um, what context around the business value that, that testing um, gives you, right? So writing tests for machine learning, how do we do it? Um, you think it's a non-deterministic system. 
right? You give machine learning models a bunch of images and they sometimes are right, sometimes are wrong. Um, but most machine learning systems are still deterministic. So if you give them the same image to the same model, it should produce the same output. Um, this is exactly what we would call a unit test in traditional software development. Um, so that concept still holds. You have a model and you give it an image that you know you've, you've taken this image beforehand and you've pre-labeled it and you know exactly what is supposed to come out of it. So that's a basic unit test that you can write. And you should have these unit tests for most of your core uh, classifications in your model if you're doing like object detection, right? If you're building an object detection model to detect products, you should have like a basic Coke can and say, okay, can it detect a Coke can? Like this is just a basic unit test to make sure. Uh, of course, you can't cover 100% of all of the products that you want, but something is better than nothing, right? And like it says in the slide, there's nothing special about machine learning that says you can't at least unit test, right? You know, I think this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue because people are fearful of the hallucination, you know? And you can probably eliminate some of that through unit testing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, there are entire companies like software as a service type platforms that their whole mission is to provide testing services for machine learning teams. Um, they're great. I've seen some of their products and, and they have really nice UIs and dashboards and they can give you all sorts of statistics on your unit test suite. Um, so you can do some more complicated statistics that say, okay, here's my machine learning model. And let's say I really, really care about these these cases, and then we're going to try to perform okay on these cases. So you can have a few different test suites that say, all right, for whatever model that I build, it should at least be able to recognize a Coke can, box of Cheerios, and a box of Kleenex, right? Um, which is not super important in a retail setting, but if this was a machine learning model for a self-driving car, and you really want to make sure that it can detect a person crossing a highway, you should have a lot of unit tests of pictures of people crossing highways. Okay. And for that test suite, you give it all the images of people. And if it doesn't detect 99.999% of them, you don't deploy that model, right? Yeah. Um, this is not hard code to write either. Um, and then you might have different test cases for different things. So maybe you have speed limit signs. You don't need nine 99.999% um, detection on speed limit signs. Maybe you can get away with 80%, right? So the way you do unit testing is a little bit different in a machine learning system, but the um, the basics are still there. A lot of times what we end up doing is, you know, instead of saying one input to one output, you're going to have a hundred different examples of something that you care about, and you're going to do statistics on the result. You're going to see how many of those hundred it got correct. And then that way, when you build a new model, we have all these metrics that we use to classify models like mean average precision, um, non-discounted gain, normalized discounted gain. Um, but these unit tests can really be your North Star, not North Star, your sanity check to yeah. show that maybe the model statistically did better, but actually on people detection, it did a little worse. And so maybe we shouldn't use this new model because people detection is really important to our core business. So that's something that you definitely should do. And if you have an integrated team with computer vision engineers and software developers, traditional software engineers, you know, guess who's really good at writing unit tests these days? Traditional software engineers. Oh, yeah. Guess who probably has never written a unit test in their life? Um, you know, a machine learning engineer who maybe got, has only written Python, Maybe they got a master's degree, but you know, I'm getting a master's degree right now. They, the quality of the code that they get you to write in a master's program is not that high. They no, just want to know that you know the algorithms. Yeah, yeah. Um, what you do at work is going to be a lot more challenging. Yes. So if you have an integrated team, if you get your software engineers to work with your computer vision engineers to develop these unit tests and these unit test suites, you can get really far really quickly. And then end-to-end -end test suites, right? So I drew the pipeline here again. Um, so it's gonna be really hard to test this whole system end-to-end -end if you're testing it from capture all the way to reporting. 
I mean, you definitely could do that. That's going to be something like a user acceptance test. But really what we want to do is, is make a test at each phase in each um, interface here. So if you're using event-driven architecture, like we talked earlier, another thing that that gives you is a much easier way to end-to-end -end test these components. So what we were just talking about was testing the inference piece. The input of inference is an image, maybe some metadata, and the output is some business relevant result. Um, so you can end-to-end -end test that whole system using the message bus or like Kafka or your, your queuing system as the interfaces. This is gonna be a little bit more complicated than end-to-end -end testing in a traditional software system, but no more complicated than a traditional distributed software system. So again, this is something your traditional software de developers are gonna have a lot of experience in. They can really help the computer vision uh, folks write these end-to-end -end tests and maintain them where the computer vision folks just plug in the specifics of that application. Um, so data collection, also you can write end-to-end -end tests for that, no problem. Um, training, of course, you, you don't necessarily need to end-to-end -to -end test your training pipeline unless you're at that level of scale where the whole thing is so automated that it, it kicks itself off and then it does its own statistics. Um, a lot of times that's the last piece to be tested. And then of course, the capturing and pre-processing steps, these are really easy to end-to-end -end test. But the only difference is really you're inputting an image in a lot of these scenarios. You're, you're throwing an image file around. This is some image you've captured from production. And like we talked about with data drift, you may need to update this image over time. You may need to get new test data. Um, so you're gonna need to have some, some way to track you know, these images and these data sets that you're using for your testing. Okay, and another thing that we wanna do uh, specifically, model evaluation. Now this step is not really uh, relevant to traditional software systems. Like I said, you write some code, it's gonna keep working uh, as long as you don't change anything else about it. That's not true for machine learning systems and computer vision systems because of data drift. So most machine learning systems, you're gonna want a model evaluation step. This is while the model is in production, you're giving it um, data from production and you're evaluating it on these metrics, the same metrics you would use during your training pipeline so that you know you can quantify the amount of data drift that you're experiencing because that model is gonna start to decrease in performance over time. So the, the training set that you gave it, it might have a 99% accuracy. And then over time, you might notice that with the actual data that's coming in from production, it's going down 95, 90. 85% accuracy. And at some point you'll have to pull the trigger and say, okay, we have to retrain this model. Um, you can only do that if you're continually evaluating it against production data, uh, collecting the metrics against production data. Um, and that's what we call model evaluation. Luckily, you should have all the code that you need for this. It's the same as your training pipeline. You just have to change the data set to use a more updated data set uh, that reflects production. All right, and lastly, we're getting to the application checklist. This is the slide with all the text on it. This is, if I was to build a new computer vision system uh, from scratch today, these are the things that I would put in my checklist to make sure that I do to save myself all these headaches. Um, the first one is that I've split up my CV code into distinct components. That's the collection step, pre-processing, inference. I should be able to run each of those components separately and on different compute with a, a message bus in between them, right? I should have really well-defined inputs and outputs for each of those steps. I should have good testing for each of those steps, right? And I should have independent scalability. This is not as important if you've just started your system, but as you grow, you're not gonna scale all these steps out at the same rate. Your inference is probably gonna scale first and then your training might scale and then your data collection might scale but they're gonna scale, stretch and grow at different rates. And so if you don't have the ability to scale them independently of one another, you're gonna spend a lot of money on compute that you didn't need to, right? Next, I'm gonna check for bottlenecks in my system. Make sure that you have really good metrics at each of these steps so you can see if there is a bottleneck in bandwidth. Um, if you are noticing that, um, you know, 
the collection and upload step of your pipeline is the bottleneck, that might be an indication that you need to move your compute closer to the edge. You might have your compute more centralized and you need to move it closer to the edge because bandwidth is really your bottleneck. And really when bandwidth is a bottleneck, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Most of the time you can't just get a better internet connection. If you can, you're really lucky, but a lot of times you're stuck with what you got. So that's an indication that you need to move your compute closer to the edge, maybe get a gateway, maybe release a new version of your hardware that can do some of the processing uh, on the machine itself. After you've done that, you're gonna look for compute bottlenecks. This is the same thing as scaling independently, right? Make sure that you're not uh, collecting 100 images every minute and then only being able to process 50 of them every minute. That's a bottleneck in compute. It's not a bandwidth issue, it's just a compute issue. Most of the time you'll see this in your inference step or your training step. Next, the quality control to account for the bucket curve specifically infant mortality of that bucket curve. If you're having hardware deployments, make sure that you've at least validated that they work before you start shipping them out to customers. Validate that they work for more than a day or two. Do some quality control on every unit that you ship out. This is especially important if you are building these in-house. If you have a contract manufacturing setup, they probably have some form of QC in, in their contract with you. But if you're doing these in-house, you're an early stage startup, you're definitely gonna need this quality control step. Next, yeah, either, either, is an just, early, either an early stage startup or you're doing something you know, so unique you can't go buy it somewhere. Which is right, right. what you guys say, truly. Nobody had what you all needed. Yep, yep. Or a lot of times you're still prototyping, you know. Yeah, exactly. You might still be working on the design. So it doesn't make sense to go to contract manufacturing because you may only produce 10 of these, this model, before yeah. you make changes. Again, the customer doesn't care that you're still prototyping designs. They want the level of quality that they always expect out of their services. So you really need to make sure you have quality control on these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was what we had at Spacey. We were prototyping so quickly, it never made sense to go to contract manufacturing. So we were building these things in-house and you know, so many things can go wrong when you're building in-house that without this quality control, we had, I think, a 25 to 20, just 30% failure rate of hardware within the first week. Next, make sure your system doesn't blow up in a hardware failure. Hardware tends to fail randomly. Uh, even if you have your QC, it's gonna fail randomly. Again, the bucket curve is just a heuristic. So make sure that when your, your cameras start outputting really weird images, when camera sensors fail, they almost always fail in the same way. Um, it's not gonna blow up the rest of your system. Similarly, if there's a network outage, it's not gonna blow up your entire system or you, you know when it's happening. Um, when you have an IoT device, a network outage and a hardware failure can, can look the same because in both cases, you can't see the device in your device manager. It's not online. You need to have some way of knowing whether or not that was a network outage or if that was a hardware failure. Um, it can be hard to determine the difference, but you have to have, make sure you have really good metrics and observability to say, you know, it's offline, but I didn't see anything wrong with it before that. This is probably just a network outage. Or also maybe I have two devices on the same network. If they both go down at the same time, that's a network outage. Make sure the rest of your system doesn't go crazy when that happens and that you have the appropriate response, right? Make sure that your team setup is, um, you have cross-functional teams. That's definitely something that I would change. Um, at the companies that I worked at in the past, we had machine learning teams, software engineering teams, uh, operations teams. That meant that anytime we had a integrated issue, and most of our issues are integration level issues, there was no clear way to solve these issues without getting a bunch of people together in a meeting room. Uh, this is really just general software development advice but um, if you silo off all your machine learning experts in one team and then all your software developers in another team, when you have those integration level bugs, no one really has all the context needed to solve it. If you have smaller teams that are working on a subset of the system, but that team knows everything about that system, whenever these issues do come up, if you can identify which team they belong to, that team can operate independently and they can resolve these issues much quicker. Right. Lastly, make sure you're treating your CV exploration as exploration. It's inherently like R&D. 
don't try to track it and, and put, you know, story points and hard deadlines on these things. Um, make sure you're managing it like it's a research and development because that's essentially what it is these days. A lot of machine learning is still an art. Uh, it's not really a science yet, like software engineering is, is turning out to be. Software engineering is still a craft as well. Um, but it's a craft where a lot of the things are known these days. There's a lot of like best practices and um, we're not reinventing the wheel a lot of times in software engineering. In yeah, machine you know, learning, it's kind of like the Wild West. Yeah. It is. You know, when, when I first started in computer science, you know, there were a lot of criticisms that we didn't have the skills of people with engineering degrees, you know, because they had perfected testing they were just so much better at it than software engineers. But over time, we got better and better and better at it. And today, it's becoming a very fine art. Um, but AI is fairly new. So, you know, people like you are bringing the thought process to the forefront of how do we do this and do it effectively. I mean, it's, you know, it's an evolution thing, you know. I mean, we didn't start out in standard software being really great at all this stuff. It was really mm -hmm. not very good. And we had yeah. more time, yeah. you know. It's like, um, I mean, I was just a, a very small child when the internet was first invented, but the early phases of the internet were like crazy, right? Everyone was doing yeah. wild things. Um, applications would go down all the time. You had work in progress pages, which people never do these days. Um, but it was normal for things to just kind of be hacked together that's and right. you, you got it to work, but, you know, as far as reproducibility, observability, those were not concepts that had really kicked off yet, at least not in the mainstream. That's, That's sort of where AI is right now. It's the Wild That's West. Right. People are still exploring to kind of see what can we do with this? Right. Because of that, you know, they're, they're really just playing around with it to see what sticks. But there are no set standards yet because people haven't coalesced on what scopes and, and what really drives a lot of value. And so there's no standardization. You're having to reinvent the wheel a lot of times in machine learning these days. Um, in the future, I expect that will change as you know it sort of settles down and people find the use cases where machine learning is really valuable and how the best way to, to build those types of systems um should be written but for now yeah it's it's still very much exploratory yeah when we started the internet people didn't understand failover and redundancy on all their networking and, and you know networking components and servers on their firewalls on their on their uh web servers and you know fairly quickly people started realizing you needed to do that to have a reliable solution and then people started realizing that you could do software updates without taking down all of your web servers you could update some of them and then you could bring those up and take the other ones and update those, you know, and the same kind of a progression is going to happen around AI. You know, we're going to learn where all the, the landmines are and how to detect them and avoid them. Yep. Yep. And people are going to learn how to design systems um, with that are backed by AI. Um, that's not a part of this presentation necessarily, but that is another thing that I've been very interested in these days with AI is the design of systems. Yeah. So if you think about something like Spotify or some recommendation engine that's built on AI, um, sometimes they recommend you songs and it's great and you love that song and you're like, awesome, go AI, I love it. Other times they recommend you songs, you're like, what is this system yeah. thinking? Like, do they that. even know me at all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I experienced that. Yeah. So, um, but what Spotify did which is kind of great is they're able to show you the predictions of the AI in a list and let you just keep what you like. Um, they're building the system in a way that um, enables you to take the good parts, the good outputs of the AI and throw away the rest. And they're gonna generate 20 items and say, I like these three get rid of all the uh, the 17. And at, at that point, because of the design, you don't care that their success rate was only 15%. Yeah. Um, you still found three really good songs. And a lot okay. of times right now, we're still trying to design machine learning systems as if they were 100% accurate. But we need to think about the design of these interfaces and bake 
this probabilistic output into the design of these systems that what the user sees give the user the ability to override the ai give them the ability to throw away what what is bad and keep what's good right well, machine especially learning. with these yeah machine learning can learn from what you throw away as well i mean they'll learn what it'll learn what you don't like and um, yeah. and that's just as valuable as knowing what you do like yep yep um but yeah we had um you know ui design um is is another big topic of discussion for for machine learning systems if you're showing stuff from a database you can just show it if you're showing stuff generated by a model you know there's even laws that are people are proposing these days that say if it's generated by ai it should be required to show that it was generated by ai maybe that's not the best way to do things is to write them into law but the heart of that i think uh is really hitting on something that some part of the design of your application should show that this is probabilistic generated content. Right. Don't just trust it with a source of, you know, as if it's really true. Um, but yeah, did we get through all the bullet points? I think we missed the, the very last two. Yeah, we um, missed the last two. Right. <laughs> Going back to the, the actual. Sorry to pull you off, off topic. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, but device management, you know, make sure that you can actually update all your devices with little effort. As you scale, right? Because this PowerPoint is all about scaling uh, machine learning and computer vision systems. Make sure that an update doesn't take super long. Again, if you're using these device management tools in um, these cloud providers, it shouldn't be too hard. If you build it yourself, you might have to put a lot of effort into making sure your deployments are seamless. And then lastly, the data tagging. Uh, this goes along with all the metadata. Collect everything you, you can, but of course, you want to collect some information about the software that's running at the time and the hardware that's running at the time, because these are things that are going to get stale as, as you progress. A year from now, you're going to find out that there's some image being captured by some old software or some old hardware. And if you didn't implement this tagging, you won't have a way to separate it out from the rest of your data. Um, so that was definitely something that bit us um, at pretty much most of the places that I worked. Um, we've had new new hardware and software revisions and you don't think to do this tagging until your second revision until you you see that you can't separate this data so just do it in the first revision and then iterate on it and, and you'll be good to go Makes sense. um yeah i think that's it there's my contact information you can find me any of those places benjamin Savorabong. i usually go by ben sivo online because it's too much of a pain to type out Savorvong most of the time. <laughs> yeah. So bensivo.com, bensivo at Gmail. Um, that's also my link on most social sites. Um, I might have a Twitter. I've got a, I've got a Threads account now uh, following on that meta train. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, that was really well done. I mean, uh, you know, I learned a lot the first time I saw it, but I learned a lot more this time. And uh, the reason I just had had time to digest it and I'd had time to look through the presentation and then hearing you say it again was very helpful, you know, because it it uh, it embedded some things that I hadn't quite digested. Um, you know, I'm just going to do a real quick summary here. So what what Ben covered was machine learning versus traditional software development, the difference of the similarities, the challenges of computer vision being bandwidth, I.O. and hardware, data management and testing. And then he gave you a checklist uh, for computer vision applications. Um, so with that, I think I think we're done. And again, thanks so much, man. This was very well done tonight. I appreciate it so much. Can't wait to post it up and let people watch it. And um, and our our next podcast here on uh, AI practical applications is going. I'm going to cover um, how AI is being used in the oil and gas industry. So. Um, so with that, uh, Ben, thanks so much. Look forward to seeing you in person, talking to you again, and uh, have a good night. All right, yeah. Hopefully I'll see you around in person. Oh, yeah. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.